Hey, thank you for joining us for our latest media briefing on important healthcare issues in the news. I'm Dr. Adam Kassam, president of the Ontario Medical Association, which represents more than 43,000 doctors. We're here today to talk about wait times and the backlog of patient services that are putting Ontarians' health at risk and the solutions that Ontario's doctors are putting forward. Lengthy wait times for surgery and other medical procedures were an issue even before the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the gaps in our healthcare system. A new analysis by the OMA shows that on top of those existing problems, the pandemic has created a backlog of more than 21 million patient services. And that includes preventative care, cancer screenings, such as mammograms and colonoscopies, diagnostic tests, such as MRIs and CT scans, plus surgeries and other procedures. Now it will take the healthcare system 31 months, so more than two and a half years to clear the backlog of knee replacements, 26 months for cataract surgeries, 19 months for hip replacements, and 16 months for heart bypass surgery. The size of the pandemic backlog and its impact on wait times will grow as we learn about how many surgeries and procedures were canceled during the recent pause on non-emergency procedures due to the Omicron variant. And so we face two challenges today, as it looks like the pandemic phase of COVID is closer than ever to ending, hopefully. So first, we need to clear the backlog while also implementing a long-term solution for wait time so that patients can get the care that they need. And this is an urgent problem that requires immediate action. Ontario's doctors, in consultation with clinical experts and health system leaders and with support from Santa's Health, are recommending the most, significant the most significant ambulatory care modernization in more than three decades. We are calling on the creation of publicly funded integrated ambulatory centers to reduce wait times for surgeries and procedures and to keep pace with the healthcare needs of our growing and aging population. And shifting appropriate day surgeries and procedures to integrated ambulatory centers could improve the experience for patients by reducing wait times, providing shorter recovery times, and lower infection rates. In fact, in other jurisdictions, these types of clinics also resulted in savings to the healthcare system. By serving patients safely and efficiently at integrated ambulatory centers, we would ease the pressure on overburdened hospitals and enhance hospitals' capacity to deliver more complex, acute, and emergency care of the kind that requires inpatient service. The need to address both the pandemic backlog and wait times is urgent. That's why Ontario's doctors are calling on the provincial and federal governments to act immediately and provide the necessary funding to clear the backlog now while they, now, while they work to implement the new integrated ambulatory center model. And Ontarians agree with us. A recent Ipsos survey conducted for the OMA found that Ontarians want the government to prioritize clearing the backlog of healthcare services built up during the pandemic, even if it means a short-term impact on economic recovery. So now I'd like to introduce two of our esteemed guests who will be giving their perspectives on the system transformation being proposed by Ontario's doctors. Dr. Jim Wright is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and former surgeon in chief at SickKids Hospital in Toronto. He is chief of the Ontario Medical Association's Economics Policy and Research Division. Dr. Mary Ann Arts is the Chief of Department of Surgery at, and Code Medical Director of the Perioperative Program at St. Joseph's Healthcare Center, part of the Unity Health Toronto Hospital Network. Her clinical practice is focused on minimally invasive general surgery and bariatric surgery. Dr. Wright, can you please start by outlining the benefits of this shift to this more modern model of ambulatory facilities recommended by doctors? How will patients be better served? And what about physicians and what will be the impact on hospitals and the overall healthcare system? Thanks, Dr. Kazem. Um, I want to emphasize one of the points, a lesson that's been learned worldwide, including other provinces, is that ambulatory surgery and procedural centers can deliver the same care 20 to 30% more efficiently and probably higher quality. We believe if this was a way, uh, with this as a way to reduce wait times, it actually would reduce burnout clinicians would feel they, like they were making a real impact. When I was surgeon in chief at SickKids, about half of the surgery we performed was same day, or what we would call ambulatory. Despite my best efforts, there was no way that I could get these streams separated to achieve those efficiencies. So I was desperate for an ambulatory surgical center. Now we do have independent health facilities in Ontario, but they're a relatively small number. They are not doing the range of surgeries they could do. And the model is almost 30 years old. So that prompted us to come up with a new model. And as we began to think about this, we wanted to ensure that any new model is fully integrated with the public health system, that it's publicly funded, OHIP insured, and that there's no skimming of cases, um, that it focuses on quality and the quadruple aim, and that 
we need to pay attention to the HHR crisis, which is ongoing, particularly healthcare worker burnout. And it needs to align with the system needs, but also regional needs. So that led us to develop this concept of integrated ambulatory centers. But I want to emphasize it's a model of care. It's a fundamental transformation to the way that we deliver outpatient or ambulatory care for patients uh, in, in Ontario. And this was highlighted as far back as two, 2012 in the Drummond Report, and even this past August by the um, Auditor General, who said that we are underutilizing this option for Ontarians. So in our model that we're proposing, uh, we would see a vast expansion uh, in the numbers of these centers that would allow them to do a much greater percentage of surgery, but also expanding the range of surgeries that occur. Critical to this model is partnership with the local hospitals, the acute care institutions, but embedded within the regions. And increasingly, as we see Ontario health teams coming uh, uh, to the forefront of healthcare planning that they would work together. We also uh, would envision a transform quality um, and oversight, um, which would be done together with the hospital. So both would be perhaps accredited at the same time. We're proposing a different funding model so that the skimming, that is the lower acuity, high remuneration cases, aren't in competition between acute care institutions and this IACs. And then finally, this will require a new legislative change uh, to uh, encompass uh, this new model. But we have to recognize it's going to take us a bit of a time to reach this. So in the first stage, we need to continue with funding the high priority areas with our existing capacity. In stage two, we would begin to see some of these IACs come online. Uh, we would have the legislative framework. And then finally in phase three, we would see a vastly expanded number of IACs, these partnerships arranged and a um, integration within uh, both the regional planning and the system level for the entire province. So I'll stop there, um, Adam, and turn it back to you. Thanks, Dr. Wright. Um, I'd like to now turn things over to Dr. Arts, who can tell us a little bit about her experience on the front lines of a hospital surgical department during the pandemic and some of the concerns and, and thoughts that she has with regards to surgical care in the province. Dr. Arts. Thanks, Dr. Kassam. Um, so as uh, Dr. Kassam mentioned, I'm a surgeon. Um, I work at St. Joseph's Hospital in Toronto. Uh, we service about uh, 500,000 people in our community, um, and we have 400 hospital beds. We have one of the busiest emergency rooms in the city. And um, even prior to the pandemic, there was a wait list, a wait list for um, hips and knees, uh, for cataract surgery. Um, and this only grew during the pandemic to make up this backlog that we now have. When I started on as my role of chief of surgery at St. Joe's, there were about 3,000 people on the wait list. This was this past June in 2021. And really what we did was try to mobilize all the resources that we had in order to manage and treat these people that have been waiting. Uh, so we opened an extra operating room. We extended our operating room days. Um, and despite all of these measures and getting our uh, number of cases up to 110%, we hardly made a dent on, on our wait list. Um, by December of this past year, our wait list was still around 3,000 people waiting for surgery. Now, with this last wave of Omicron, we've seen that number just rise. It's at about 3,200 uh, patients. So during each wave of this pandemic, most non-urgent and non-emergent types of surgery have been put on hold. In order to have enough hospital beds and resources to treat very sick patients with COVID, as a result, this means that individuals uh, waiting for surgery have been asked um, to wait, wait for so shoulder surgery so that they can be independent and dress themselves, wait for hip or knee surgery so that they can walk or exercise or return to work, wait for bariatric surgery to manage their diabetes and hypertension, wait for uh, investigations and treatment for fertility. Um, or wait for cataract surgery in order to be see, to see and be independent again. So two years have passed and, and many of these patients are, are still waiting. Uh, I think one of the things is when we talk about these surgeries, um, which are non-urgent, non-emergent, they're not elective surgeries. All these people on this list 
have not chosen to have surgery, they need it. And we've just been kind of pushing them down um, the list as a more urgent case comes, comes along. And that's just how we prioritize in an acute care hospital. Um, it's all that we can do. But all of these patients are, are suffering uh, emotionally, uh, psychologically. Often many of them are using opioids on a daily basis uh, to manage their pain and they're not working. And you know, as a surgeon, it's really hard to see this. It's really hard to not be able to offer patients care who are waiting and in need of it. Uh, I really welcome this idea of uh, amateur surgical centers. I think there's a lot of work that's going on in the province and I really thank the OMA for taking this on. Thanks so much, Dr. Arts. And, and to your point, you know, this is all care that is essential, that people who are waiting on lists, who are suffering, who are waiting for care, they need this care. And so while we like to use this term of non-emergent, non-urgent, it does not mean non-essential. And it's important that uh, not only the public, but, but, but even sort of the media understand that this is care that is required. Uh, you know, and thanks both Dr. Arts and Dr. Wright for sh shedding some light on the backlog and the wait times and doctors' solutions to addressing some of the problems through this new model of care. You know, the pandemic has shown us that the current model is simply not sustainable. And it's not just about throwing more money at the problem and extending operating room hours, even though perhaps in the short term, that might be a necessary bridge as we think about the future. But really, you know, helping to address the current backlog, we are covering calling on the government to not only uh, commit to those funds and, and to those extensions of operating room hours, but also to consider uh, and, and implement this integrated access centers in, in, these, in these ways. You know, the, the integrated ambulatory centers will go a step further in terms of modernizing surgical de delivery in Ontario and will help also help us to address surgical wait times in the future. We also have to remember this is also about certain types of procedures that can also be done. So we think about cancer screening like mammograms and colonoscopies, you know, upstream of having a surgery, there are other factors at play. And this is this will be part of that integrated system that we believe will be key to addressing the needs of Ontarians. And so the recommendations Ontario's doctors are making to improve our healthcare system for patients are, are in alignment with what Ontarians say that they need. And we have a solution and we have to, frankly, just start acting now. And so with that, we are going to transition now to opening up our Q&A session for members of the media. Our uh, colleague Ashley Molnar will be moderating this portion of today's briefing. So please put your questions in the Q&A chat function down in the Zoom. And if, you, if we don't get to your questions, due to time or for other reasons, the media team will follow up with you. And you can also email media at, in, at, media at OMA.org with additional requests for interviews. And we'll also have a recording of the session available later this afternoon. So with that, Ashley, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Our first question is for Dr. Wright. How many clinics do we need to take the pressure off of hospitals? Will the clinics be evenly distributed across the province? We haven't set an exact uh, number uh, of these clinics. So um, part of this plan is transitioning the existing independent health facilities and perhaps these out of hospital premises, which is yet another route for um, um, procedures, particularly being done out of hospitals. So we would see over the next year, a couple of years of transitioning them to this model. Um, not every region can sustain uh, an independent uh, ambulatory center. So we imagine in some areas um, that would continue to be done um, in hospitals. But this would not be um, spread evenly. It's where the, where the needs are. And that's why involvement of the regional planning tables, which are being set up through um, Ontario Health, working with the acute care hospitals and the Ontario Health teams as they uh, begin to arise, is helping them understand what are the population needs and where would the patient ideally receive their treatment. And I wanna emphasize that um, not every patient is appropriate, um, either because of the procedure they would receive or because of their health needs, but there is a large percentage of patients who could receive um, their surgery in these centers. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Follow-up question for you. Who would work at these clinics? Do we have enough specialists and nurses to work at both hospitals and ambulatory clinics? And if doctors and nurses have to work at 120% over the years to clear the backlog, how are those professionals going to be able to work at ambulatory clinics as well? Yeah, there's two uh, parts of that question. Um, and I think uh, both of my colleagues have referenced this. Uh, to address the backlog, um, given that we were not meeting wait time targets even before 
you often hear figures that we would have to work 20% uh, higher. Um, you know, I certainly hope um, uh, that we're able to increase the amount of flow through that we've had, but realistically, healthcare workers are, exa are completely exhausted and we do have um, insufficient number of healthcare workers to address uh, both the long-term needs, but also um, what, what, what has been uh, occurred through COVID. So um, we certainly, uh, I admire enormously the commitment of healthcare workers across this province in responding to COVID. And they have repeatedly stepped up for whatever challenge COVID has presented to them. And I, and I believe many of them will try, uh, but we have to be realistic what we can reasonably do. The second part of the question is absolutely, we have to address the HHR crisis, which is uh, confronting the healthcare system. This is uh, where we need to invest in doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and every part of the healthcare system um, um, in order to do. So I'd answer the question in two ways. First of all, we need those staff, irrespective of whether they're done in an ambulatory center or whether they're done in an acute care institution, we need those uh, people. So the second part of the answer is we need to invest concurrently as we develop these models and making sure we have sufficient uh, healthcare workers uh, to meet the need of Ontarians. Thank you, Dr. Wright. The next question is with uh, Sergio Ariangio uh, with CTV Northern Ontario um, for Dr. Kassam. Dr. Kassam, can you speak to the benefits of this new model for rural and northern communities? How would this address backlog we're seeing right now? Yeah, so it's a very important question and the OMA has actually been committed for a, a while now uh, to address and help address the needs of the North. In fact, when we launched our platform in October, we went up to Sudbury, we met with uh, the, uh, the Northern School of Medicine, we met, we met with uh, the mayor of, of Sudbury and, and, and other local leaders to really hone in on some of the key issues that are facing Northern rural um, and remote communities. And of course, this is a challenge. Dr. Wright mentioned about how certain communities may or may not be able to have an integrated ambulatory Center, but there are opportunities to have regionalization of care delivery, and this is where these in, in, these integrated ambulatory centers might actually be of, of, of value. So when you think about perhaps tertiary academic centers, and we have a couple of those up in the north, partnering with these institutions along with hospitals that exist, and to develop a framework that will actually, I believe, have, have a significant impact on, on, on care delivery in these parts of the province, which cannot go neglected like they have been in the past. And, and, and just to build on Dr. Wright's other point, which is we need to be able to scale up some of our HHR and be able to support not only current needs, but then the future needs of these communities. And so this requires, once again, investment, but also creative thinking about how to bring and support health human resources, i.e. healthcare workers in the field right now. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Sutter with the Canadian Press for Dr. Art. Um, how are hospitals catching up on delayed surgeries now? Are hospitals actually in a position to start resuming them? What are the challenges? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, so we're, we've, we've had some changes just in the last week. Uh, there was a, a directive two from the Ministry of Health in, in place where we were only doing um, urgent and emergent surgeries. Uh, that was uh, partially lifted last week, and we are now resuming at least 70% of our um, elective or scheduled surgeries. Um, this has its challenges, though. Uh, there are a lot of patients that are still taking up uh, acute care surgery beds, uh, so we do not have many beds for patients who are undergoing uh, scheduled surgeries that need to be admitted, um, and uh, there's still some ICU requirements. Um, so we're not yet at 100% or even at 110%, um, and it's been kind of a graduated um, uh, increase, and really it's because of the demand uh, for the hospital resources that we haven't been able to move up uh, more quickly. Thank you, Dr. Arts. Another question from Holly McKenzie Sutter with the Canadian Press for all of our panelists. Are the panelists concerned at all about Ontario's reopening plan, uh, intent to lift vaccination passports and masking mandates? Could this cause surgeries to be delayed again? Who do you want to go first, Ashley? Um, uh, you go first. 
Sure. Yeah. So certainly, as you know, first of all, I know that um, we're transitioning to a to reopening in, in Ontario, and obviously, this is welcome news for a lot of folks right across the province. And you know, this has to be, you know, with a measured sense of optimism that we are moving forward. As Dr. Arts was describing, this also includes the lifting of Directive Two, which the OMA has actually been advocating for uh, for since it since it was introduced in, it, at a point when it would when it could have been and should have been done safely. And so we're, we're optimistic that we can ramp up services. But to the point uh, that the question is asking, which is, are we worried about the future potential, uh, you know, escalation in, uh, of cases and our ability to absorb some of this capacity? That that remains to be seen. I think there is a general cautious optimism. We see the numbers that Dr. Moore presented yesterday or the day before with uh, decreasing hospitalizations, increasing capacity in our hospitals, increasing and more specifically, more robust capacity in our ICU, you, our ICU system. So right now we are cautiously optimistic. It's hard to prognosticate what two, four, six weeks will look like, but we should be able to adjust as we start seeing those numbers in real time. And then we'll, we're gonna take continue to take the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, with regards to this. I think I would just add to that, that I think with this messaging that we're getting in the media, we are gonna see you know, a real increase now in patients returning to the hospital, to their physicians, and we're going to have increased demand on our services uh, for diagnostic reasons and also for surgery. So that's what we're trying to brace ourselves for and what we're most concerned about, uh, that our, our backlog is going to increase, our wait lists are going to increase uh, because of this. So that's what we have to prepare ourselves for. I have nothing more, Ashley, so thanks. Thank you all very much. Our next question is again from CTV Sudbury, and this is going to be for Dr. Kassam. Also, also on the Northern Ontario perspective, which has been struggling to attract and retain medical professionals, how could Northern communities support these centers? Is there any other way to address the backlog in those communities? So certainly, Incentives need to be aligned to, to attract and retain folks who perhaps are not from that region to come up and serve. We have had those opportunities in the past, and we need to continue to not only support them, but perhaps make them more robust, especially as it pertains to the immediate need to, to, to get through the backlog. The other thing I would say is that as we think about the future and we think about a pipeline of, uh, of sustainability for health and resources, but also healthcare service in, in these remote and rural communities, we need to think about supporting institutions like North, the Northern School of Medicine, expanding some of those medical school spots that also have to be commensurately um, matched with residency spots or the training uh, programs that come with it. We've talked a little bit about working upstream. So getting people and folks who perhaps didn't or wouldn't think about a career in medicine, get them early into that pipeline so that they can also not only think about a future of medicine, but also help to serve their communities. And then finally, we would want to think about leveraging technology that we've seen be sort of, you know, a, a growing innovation in this space uh, throughout the pandemic. How do we leverage technology to be able to deliver service in these regions? These are some of the key points that we want to try and help um, sort of focus in on as we think about the future. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Our next question is from Alan Hale with Queen's Park Today. And this question is for Dr. Wright. If the ambulatory clinics are an idea the province wants to pursue, what should the government's first step be? So um, uh, it would be recognizing of shifting from the current model um, of independent health facilities are working very hard uh, within the constraints of the system in which they function is to begin to shift to this new model, a cooperative partnership model with acute care institutions uh, working towards legislative changes, which are necessary um, to manage this new model, uh, to develop a new funding model. So this competition um, that sometimes arises on what we call the lower acuity, uh, relatively higher remunerative cases, that that part of that partnership is understanding and make sure that there are not counter incentives to patients receiving care in ambulatory centers. So um, working uh, with a variety of stakeholders um, to, um, uh, to make this a model reality. You've heard in the short term, uh, we need to invest with the existing structure. The hospitals have really stepped up. They've been under siege um, and they've been working very hard. So investing in our hospitals, particularly in the short term, um, as we move uh, to this model and then concurrently dealing with the HHR. Uh, we need more nurses, more doctors. Um, and this is a reality um, that we just have to confront and we have to invest now. And it'll be a well, uh, a well, a good investment uh, for the future. 
Thank you, Dr. Wright. I'd like to go back to uh, Dr. Arts, who um, I think wanted to say something more uh, with regards to our uh, previous question about Northern Ontario and if there's more communities can do to um, improve the backlog. I just I just wanted to comment about what has changed over the pandemic. And I think Dr. Kassam mentioned this regarding virtual care. Um, and also just as my role as a bariatric surgeon, there are a lot of programs that we can do as a province together. Um, where a lot of the care can be done in the northern community and if necessary at an ambulatory surgical center, the patient could come uh, for their actual procedure, regardless of that where that is. These ambulatory surgical centers will require people to travel to get to, um, and so that'll be for all patients that are uh, involved. So I think there's a lot of room for partnership, um, and we've seen that work really well in, in, in the Ontario Bariatric Program. Thank you, Dr. Arts. Our next question is from Kylie Taker um, with the Medical Post, and this is for Dr. Wright. At what uh, stage of discussion are we at with the province on adopting uh, the integrated ambulatory centers? Can you give us some examples of surgeries that would be, be performed at these centers? Yeah, absolutely. That would be my pleasure. So we've uh, really benefited from um, the interaction and advice of colleagues both at Ontario Health and the Ministry of Health. Um, um, they're very uh, interested and excited about um, uh, expanding ambulatory surgery and procedure capacity in the province. Uh, they're very open to new in innovative models and um, we hope that they will embrace much of what we've said. So I've, I've emphasized that um, not only uh, would we see these IACs expand the percent of uh, ambulatory surgery and procedures they do, but we've learned um, in the past 30 years, the number of surgeries that can be performed safely and at the same or higher quality is vastly expanded. So it's not just a percentage of the surgeries that we have historically done in IHFs, it's the ability to expand. So what am I talking about? Well, moving beyond uh, cataract surgery to uh, uh, virtually all of the ophthalmologic procedures, barring those patients who have otherwise uh, serious illnesses that would require them to be done uh, in an acute care in a hospital. Orthopedics has, has exploded with the number uh, of procedures. There's even a possibility of doing same day uh, arthroplasty, replacing hips and knees. Uh, now this is a small subset of patients, but those that could have it on the same day would be um, um, a huge uh, benefit. Uh, general surgery procedures, which are, are really being done in a minimal uh, uh, outpatient basis currently could be done in these ambulatory centers. Gynecologic surgery. There's a lot of dermatologic uh, procedures that could be done. Uh, ear, nose and throat, uh, otolaryngology, um, uh, plastic surgery, and uh, finally, um, um, yeah, even podiatric surgery could be done in some of these centers. So there's a lot uh, of vastly expanded and these are being done in ambulatory centers, particularly uh, in the US, but also in other jurisdictions uh, of Canada. So we're behind in utilizing this model and we need to catch up and provide this for Ontarians. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Uh, we're nearing the end of our Q&A session. So if uh, media have any other questions, please enter them into the Q&A box now. Um, so at this point, um, the final question that we have today, and I'll open this up to, um, um, to Dr. Wright again and Dr. Kasim if he wants to jump in. Um, and this is from Nathan Crocker with CBC News. Is there something else that you want done to make a difference in the shorter term before these centers can be built? Um, and a separate question to that, do you have a sense of whether the government will support this plan. So I would only add one more thing, which we have mentioned on a couple of occasions, and I think uh, both of my colleagues have mentioned. I think we need to uh, turn our head to burnout among healthcare workers. Um, this also pre-existed the pandemic. This was something we were very worried about, looking at our colleagues who were exhausted and wrung out. That's, that's been, we have quantitative numbers to show that that's actually been substantially worsened through the pandemic and our physician colleagues, and I think um, nurses and all other healthcare workers. So that's a specific area we need to turn our attention to. And I don't think we've really uh, realized, unfortunately, the impact that the COVID has had on the mental health and the workplace exhaustion. So that's the only additional comment um, that I would make. 
Yeah, and just building on Dr. Wright's point, I mean, the only thing immediately would be to try and scale up existing infrastructure and leveraging what we have right now, obviously, to get through the next several months, which would include an expansion of, you know, operating room hours, but again, measured with the understanding that health human resources uh, can and tends to be a limiting step there, especially as a result of the past 21 months, burnout, exhaustion, all the things that Dr. Wright just described. And then finally, of course, comes with, coming with that has to has to be the funding that it actually can be used in order to be able to support that care delivery. And so that's that's the only other thing I would say that in the immediate short term would be a reasonable step forward. But Dr. Arts, maybe you have also some uh, final thoughts there. Well, I, I really do think funding for our, our human resource issues would be, be helpful in incentivizing it uh, to get more people into the healthcare field. Um, you know, that would allow us to even do more where we are uh, and with what resources we have in the hospitals. Um, I, I do point out that whatever whatever surgeries we can do in these ambulatory surgical centers will take the pressure off the hospitals uh, to be able to do more. So uh, I think that will also help uh, with the, the well-being for everybody working in uh, healthcare right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Arts. Our next question is from Emma Jones with Healthing.ca for Dr. Kassam. Are there any examples of ambulatory centers currently open in Ontario or even Canada? I think Dr. Wright's a better position to speak on this, but I do believe that one of the key models here, especially with the Drummond Report in 2012, was the Kensington uh, Center that is in downtown Toronto. That serves as an example of one of these uh, ambulatory centers that has been quite successful in being able to deliver service and helping to offload some of the partnered hospitals uh, that it works with. But Dr. Wright, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, so um, we obviously um, um, often look to the US um, um, as uh, an example. And this is one of the cases, um, while I appreciate there are dramatic differences uh, between uh, Canada and the United States in terms of their healthcare delivery, they have really leveraged this opportunity. What I say, the higher efficiency and probably higher quality. Uh, but even within Canada, uh, Saskatchewan and uh, British Columbia have both uh, invested in ambulatory centers, not quite uh, with the kind of cooperative model um, that we're talking about, but they have realized the um, increased efficiency and cost effectiveness of the centers. Um, uh, Dr. Kassam mentioned the Kensington Eye uh, Institute. That's as close to the model that we're uh, bringing forward. It's very much a cooperative um, arrangement between a particular UHN and more recently uh, Unity Health. Uh, where these kinds of arrangements can be done um, that leverages the advantages of ambulatory centers for the appropriate procedure, the appropriate patient. Um, they're still limited in the scope of the procedures they're doing, but uh, that would be as close to the kind of model that we would want to see across the province, um, north, south, east, and west. Um, er every part of the province should, should be able to avail themselves uh, of this modality. Thank you very much. Our next question is for Dr. Arts. Do you, uh, you do a lot of bariatric surgery. How has this been impacted by the pandemic and what does that mean for those patients who are waiting? Yeah, so this, this has really been impacted uh, by the pandemic. Every time that there's been a wave, uh, these surgeries have been put on hold. Uh, but even as we then open up and start doing more scheduled surgeries again, these patients have to stay in hospital. They require a hospital bed. Um, and so we have been unable to kind of ramp up the same way and as, as quickly. Um, as many people know, it, it is quite a comprehensive program that these patients go through. So between the time that they decide to pursue bariatric surgery, they go through a comprehensive program of dietitian and internist. Uh, they get lots of education and counseling. Um, and, and it could take up to about a year for them to actually be ready for surgery. Then they get there and there's no opportunities for surgery. So it's, it's more waiting for them. Um, and it does have a lot of impact on, on what they can then do. Um, often they're waiting for some reason. They've made this life choice um, and they're ready to go, right? They're motivated. They want to get exercising. They want to kind of change their lifestyle. Um, and they want to take that next step in their life. Uh, be it building their family or whatever it is, and it, it all just goes on hold. Uh, so we have seen the impact uh, a lot, um, and, uh, and it is a problem. 
Thank you, Dr. Ertz. Uh, the next question is from Kylie Taggart with the Medical Post for Dr. Wright. What has been the reaction to integrated ambulatory centers from family physicians? Is there concern that they will have to manage more post-operative care with this new model? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, that's a very astute observation. Um, and um, that primary care uh, fulfills a really important role, both in um, before surgery or procedures in um, the, uh, the referral process and supporting families through the decision-making. Uh, certainly in my experience, uh, while I um, had a wonderful relationship with many families, they often looked to their primary care provider, um, their physician to um, have the discussions around um, uh, both making the decision and preparing them uh, for surgery. Um, then after the surgery, um, there is clearly um, a need through a variety. Sometimes it's uh, home care, uh, sometimes it's long-term care, sometimes it's um, um, in the home with the support of the primary care provider. So that's why we think the integration, which we emphasize is at multiple levels. So it's integrated with the acute care institution so that patients are appropriately treated uh, based on their procedure and their health conditions in the right setting. But as we see Ontario health teams and, and family physicians uh, being a part of um, Ontario health teams, it's bringing all these resources together in, in an integrated way. Um, the, uh, there, there is fragmentation in the healthcare system, which I think places a real burden on primary care. So as we move forward, the integration of these resources supporting patients will be absolutely critical. And um, we, we believe this will be embraced by the primary care uh, community as long as we're able to achieve this uh, model of integration. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Another question for you. You mentioned you tried to introduce two streams at SickKids. Can you elaborate on the two streams and what some of the hesitation was? Yeah, so I need to explain um, that ambulatory um, centers function at a different pace um, than an inpatient hospital. Through pre-selection, both in terms of the procedure and the patient, they move rapidly through that system. And that's where you achieve this 20 or 30% um, efficiency. It's both rapid turnover, it's um, the efficiency that comes from focusing on a smaller number of procedures. So when I was at Sick Kids, um, I would say there's actually three streams. You have emergent care, patients coming in through the emergency department, which is not a part of um, uh, 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 IACs. You have your scheduled uh, surgery. You have uh, inpatient surgery. You have your scheduled outpatient surgery. And then, of course, there's urgent cases, which are not quite emergent, but urgent. So in fact, now I've described four separate streams. The inpatient scheduled surgery, they're usually the sicker patients who require much more time. Um, the rooms are bigger, more equipment, uh, longer turnover. And to try and separate these streams when they are physically co-located despite my best efforts. And, and I think this is again, the experience worldwide. You know, hospitals do a great job. They work really hard to improve their efficiency, but these streams all mixing together, there's just no way to realize the efficiency that comes from what some people call focus factories, which is separating these streams physically and operationally. That's the way to achieve the efficiencies. And it allows the hospitals to concentrate on the sick, more acutely ill patients, which they are better position to do so because of all of the supports and the ICUs and all the things those patients need. So I hope I've explained uh, my dilemma. Um, we tried really hard and we made some good progress, but I could never achieve the efficiencies that an IAC could. Thank you, Dr. Wright. This next question is for Dr. Kassam. This sounds like a great plan, but as you said, it will take a few years to implement. What could be done immediately to address backlog? Yeah, so I think that this question was asked in perhaps a different way prior to, to this question. However, you know, as we think about the this approach for IECs to be built out and, and serve the people of Ontario, we, we are calling for sort of a phased approach. And in the phase one, which is 
sort of this immediate need right now in sort of the months and perhaps even let's say call it 12 to 18 month window where care needs to be provided. We need to scale up our existing infrastructure. We need to get people who have been waiting for care back into the hospitals that unfortunately, as Dr. Arts was describing as a result of directive two in previous waves had to ramp down service. We need to fully ramp up service and then, and then sort of scale up all of the existing infrastructure in and around the margins. So again, extending operating room times, funding that goes along with it, ensuring that the health human resources are supported to be able to deliver deliver those services immediately. That's what we can be doing in the next three to five to seven months in order to make sure that our system can get back up and running in the way that it was prior to the pandemic, and then, then focus on how we can use this concept of an IEC or the IEC model uh, as, as, a, as a next sort of you know, phased approach so that we can actually start building efficiencies as Dr. Wright was describing more broadly and more sustainably for the future. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Our final question today is uh, for Dr. Wright. What's the difference between an integrated health facility, which already exists in Ontario, and your proposed integrated ambulatory centers? What would happen to integrated health facilities under your proposals? Would they become integrated ambulatory centers? So um, to answer the second part of your question, we see the independent health facilities, uh, which are working very hard, would transition to this new model. So as their licenses expire, we would see the renewal uh, happening under this IAC model. So again, to emphasize, um, the IAC model is one of integration that would involve working with a, uh, through a memorandum of understanding or contractual arrangement with a local or multiple acute care institutions. So that physicians are credentialed in both uh, facilities where there's a joint decision around where the patient should receive, where skimming does not occur through a revised um, uh, uh, financing to make sure that the, um, that does not become a counter incentive. And then a safety and quality umbrella over both acute care and these IACs, probably through an existing um, Accreditation Canada that would look at the entire continuum of care, recognizing uh, from the patient's point of view, it needs to be seamless and they need to be assured wherever they have their procedure, it is of the highest quality. So this is, it, this is a big difference. IHFs are, um, as, as uh, Dr. Kassam said, are almost 30 years old. It is time to upgrade that model uh, to uh, reinforce this concept of integration and make it a reality um, as we look not just to address the backlog, but to um, uh, position Ontarians for advancing, advantaging a, a more efficient healthcare system going forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Uh, that concludes our question answer period for today. Thank you to the media for all of your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Kassam for closing remarks. Dr. Kassam. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you everyone for attending today's briefing and for your thoughtful questions from the media. I also want to take a moment to thank all healthcare workers for their extraordinary efforts on the front lines of this pandemic, including today. Most of our colleagues are seeing patients right now in the front lines, and I know that that is uh, something that needs to happen and, and is something that they've been doing so admirably uh, over the past 21 months. We also know that they've been working flat out for their patients, uh, and they continue to do that. And so I, I, I'm proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. I'm actually going to be going to the hospital a little bit later on today to see some of my patients. Um, but today, you know, we're hopeful that the system modernization that we're actually recommending will address some of the significant strain on our health human resources, but also the, the, the modernization of patient delivery, which really needs to happen as we think about the future and what a future healthcare system might look like in, in a 21st century model that we're proposing here today. And so thank you again for your time. We also want you to remember that we have our five-point plan, Ontario's Doctors' Prescription for Better Health in Ontario. We, that can be found at betterhealthcare.ca, and it, it expounds and expands upon some of the work that's not only been done by Dr. Jim Wright and his team, but also the work of the OMA as we think about other sectors in healthcare as well. So thank you, and uh, I appreciate